Harriet Tubman, Chapter 13, The Legend of Moses. Up until the time of Harriet's discovery of John Tubman's infidelity, she had been guiding escaping slaves to the North and freedom largely because she wanted to rescue members of her own family. It is true that in each group she had conducted, there were people who were not related to her, but the motive had, that had inspired the trip was always the same, to guide her own relatives into the free state of Pennsylvania. After she discovered that John had found happiness with another woman, she brought a group of slaves north with her, none of whom was related to her. This was an unplanned, spur-of-the-moment project for she, had, for she had gone back to the plantation in order to persuade her husband to go north with her. This was in keeping with the purpose behind the other trips, freedom for herself, then for her family, and, as her longing for John grew, a happy life for both of them in the north. During the next few months, she developed a much broader purpose. She pondered over the shocking contrast between the life of a field hand in Dorchester County, Maryland, and the life she had known and enjoyed in Philadelphia and in Cape May, New Jersey. The work she had done in hotels was play compared to the terrible labor she had performed as a slave. She was free to change jobs for any reason or for no reason at all. She could go anywhere in Philadelphia without a pass, and no one would question her. The money that she earned was hers, all of it, to spend as she pleased or to save. To a woman who had been a slave, these were some of the great, incredible wonders of freedom. She felt that all men should enjoy these same rights and privileges. Like the abolitionists, she believed slavery to be morally wrong for masters and slaves alike. She knew that she could not hope to end this evil by herself, but she thought she might she might help make the ownership of slaves unprofitable in the area she knew so well, the eastern shore of Maryland. She was certain that even timid, frightened slaves would run away if someone they could trust offered to guide them to the north. She decided to keep going back to the land of Egypt, as she called Maryland, bringing more and more away. She would leave directions for the bold, self-assured ones, drawing maps for them on the dirt floor of the cabins, carefully describing the stopping places on the route so that they could make the trip north without a conductor. Thus, she could slowly, steadily increase the number of runaways from that one area. Up until 1851, she was either unaware of the danger posed by the fugitive slave law, or else ignored it. But that year, the significance of the new law was brought home to her in terms of people. In Philadelphia, she heard stories about three different runaways who had found run afoul of the law, for these stories were being told everywhere, north and south. The first alarming story she heard was about a runaway named Shadrick. Shadrick? She, he was arrested in Boston on February 15, 1851, charged with being a fugitive slave. He was taken before a federal commissioner in the United States courtroom for a hearing. A great crowd collected to hear the case, for this was the first test of the new law in Boston. The hearing had barely started when the commissioner adjourned the court, to the great surprise of the people who were present. The crowd began to leave the courtroom, moving slowly. Suddenly, a group of colored men came into the room, walked over to Shadrach, and surrounded him. One of them said to him, Follow me. Shadrach, the runaway slave, was outside the courtroom, courthouse before the police officers who were guarding him were aware that they had just watched an impromptu and wonderfully effective rescue party at work. Shadrach was hidden in Boston when the search for him had ended. The Boston Vigilance Committee sent him on to Canada via the Underground Railroad. Harriet was upset by the story. In spite of its happy ending, she had always thought of Boston as a safe place, a haven for runaway slaves, just like Philadelphia. Then in April of that same year, she heard talk about a boy named Thomas Sims. He was walking along a street in Boston on the night of April 3, 1851, when he was arrested. George Tickner Curtis, the United States Commissioner, who presided at the hearing, decided that Sims, who was a fugitive slave, must be returned to his owner in Georgia. The pro-slavery crowd in the courtroom cheered, pleased with the decision, but the abolitionists were appalled and talked of rescuing Sims. But rescue was impossible. The courthouse was surrounded by a heavy chain and patrolled by a strong police force. Sims was the first slave to be sent back into slavery by Massachusetts since the Revolution. He reached Savannah, Georgia on the 19th aboard the brig Acorn, which was owned in Boston, and had been chartered by the United States government for the express purpose of returning the fugitive to his master. 
Harriet kept hearing about Thomas Sims, that when he reached Savannah, he was publicly whipped and then imprisoned for two months. After that, he was sold and resold, first in Savannah, then in Charleston, then in New Orleans. He was finally taken to Vicksburg. In 1863, when the Federal Army was besieging Vicksburg, Thomas Sims was one of the slaves who managed to reach the Federal forces. He was shipped north where he was hailed as a hero and a prize and as a prize of war. At first, Harriet could not believe it possible that anyone could be taken out of the free state of Massachusetts and sent back to a slave state. The more she thought about it, the more it disturbed her. The third story that Harriet Tubman heard about in Philadelphia that year concerned the slave Jerry, who was arrested in Syracuse, New York on the October 1st, 1851. On that same day, the Liberty Party was holding a convention in Syracuse. The delegates, having attended the morning session of the convention, had adjourned for dinner. While they were eating, they heard the slow tolling of the big bell on a nearby congregational church. Syracuse was an abolitionist stronghold, and the church bells were used to give the alarm whenever a fugitive was in danger. The news spread quickly that Jerry had been arrested and was being held in the courthouse for a hearing. The streets were soon filled with men, women, children, dogs, all excited, all heading for the place where Jerry was held. That night, a group of men battered down the door of the courthouse using a 20-foot log. Men armed with axes and crowbars forced their way to the second floor. The marshal fired at them and then jumped out of a window, his arm broken. The deputies left just as hastily. Jerry was taken out of his cell by his rescuers and finally sent to Canada and freedom via the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman heard the stories about the rescue of Shadrach and of Jerry, about the return of a of Thomas Sims to Georgia, talked about, told, and retold. These stories showed her exactly what the new law meant to runaway slaves living anywhere in the United States, and that, of course, it included her. Yet she decided that she would not permit his new and stringent law to interface with her plan to keep guiding slaves out of Dorchester County. It was now a well-known way. She recognized every creek and cove and inlet, every neck of land, every hiding place, every curve in the roads, every potential source of danger, every potential source of safety. She knew the people who lived in the farmhouses, knew which ones would welcome her and offer food and a night's lodging, knew which ones would set after her with guns and hounds. But the next trip she made could not end in Philadelphia. Her passengers, as she called the fugitives who would travel with her, would not be safe there would not be safe in Boston or in Syracuse or anywhere else in the United States. She would have to take them all the way to Canada. It would be a long trip, longer than any she had ever made, through territory that was strange and new to her, with the known hazard of the fugitive slave law pacing her every footstep. Though she was not aware of it, she had become a legend in the slave cabins along the eastern shore. She had always made the makings, had the makings of a legend in her, the prodigious strength, the fearlessness, the religious ardor, the visions she had in which she experienced moments of, pre of prescience. Stories about her would be handed down from one generation to the next, embroidered, embellished, until it would be impossible to say which part of truth, which part was fiction. But each one who heard the stories, each one who told all of them, or only parts of them, would feel stronger because of her existence. Pride in her would linger, or in the on in the pride in her would linger on in the teller of the story as well as the listener their faith in a living god would be strengthened their faith in themselves would be renewed the slaves said she could see in the dark like a mule that she could smell danger down the wind like a fox that she could move through thick underbrush without making a sound like a field mouse they said she was so strong she could pick up a grown man sling him over her shoulder and walk him for miles they said, voices muted, odd, that she talked with God every day, just like Moses. They said there was some strange power in her so that no one could die when she was with them. She enveloped the sick and the dying with her strength, sending it from her body to theirs, sustaining them. They changed her name again. At first she had been called Minta, or Minty. After her defiance over, her, over the overseer, they called her Harriet because the pet names, the diminutives, were no longer fitting for a girl who had displayed such courage. Now they called her Moses. As a result of what would always be known as the Jerry Rescue, 24 eminently respectable citizens of Syracuse, including Reverend J.W. Logan, 
Samuel May, Charles Wheaton, and Garrett Smith, who was visiting the city, were arrested and charged with constructive treason. The district attorney ordered them to Auburn for questioning. In Auburn, William H. Seward, later Lincoln's Secretary of State, was one of the first men to sign the bond that had to be posted. The case dragged along for a year, and the charge was finally dropped. And that is the end of Chapter 13.